Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. So I want to talk about modern DSG models. Uh, so let me start with the progress report. Uh, we've made a lot. When I started graduate school, uh, they were still <laughs> teaching ISLM. Uh, barely got through the prelims. Uh, really, really close call. Um, John, John tried to push the fast forward button, you know, to get more, you know, there was this rational expectations revolution and we were kind of slow to, you know, get, get on that bandwagon. But I made it through the prelims, thank God, and here I am. Fast forward to today, uh, we got some DSGEs, that's good news. Um, so optimizing households, firms, transparent, easy to understand, forward-looking agents, market clearing prices. So now we can do like serious, uh, serious stuff. Now I, I know Emmanuel's here and Nobu's here. Th those guys would say to me, you know, we can take all this stuff and jam it into the old system. They're really clever about that. Like they can take really complicated models and stick it into the ISLM. Um, it's kind of like watching my kids pack a bag, you know, you put the bag down and you <laughs> throw all their clothes in it. So I'm so glad to be actually um, studying <laughs> Marty and Harold who went to Minnesota and they, they're just not trained to do that. So <laughs> I don't have to like study any like complicated graphs or anything that I wouldn't understand. All right, so let me give, uh, as you can tell, uh, there's, a <laughs> there's a lot of debate going on in this field. Uh, you could just tell from, from the talks here. So I'm going to give... Uh, the progress report from the perspective of Marty and the perspective of Harold, but don't think about Marty and Harold. It's not Marty Harold. It's it's like all of us. So we're all in kind of the same boat, asking what I think is the key question. I'm going to focus on the key question. So Marty lists a billion achievements. Harold lists a billion challenges. I want to ask one question. It's the question. Are DSGEs useful? Not used. Used is low bar. Okay, that's low bar. That Michael Kiley is working on the Edo model in the back of the Fed, whatever. <laughs> I mean, no, really, that, I'm not even <laughs> meaning that as a joke. Um, like, whatever. Are central bankers using, in a fruitful way, these models? Are they using them to make predictions? about serious policy or not. Marty would say they are, they are, okay? So he's taking a stance, that's good. I like when people take a stance. Uh, Harold, he's a maybe, but really like if you read the chapter that he gave me, it's a no. So he's on the other side. And I would say there's a lot of us in there debating this, okay? So I'm going to try to give you the sense, especially those of you who are more the corporate finance finance guys, what is, why are we at odds with each other, okay? It's going to be surprisingly same answer for both. So bear with me. Marty would say, and I'm going to use his words because you always get mad if I paraphrase him. Okay. <laughs> A key challenge was to develop an empirically plausible version of the new Keynesian model. And then he goes on to say, you know, that his work with Christiano and Evans met this challenge. His words. And so I, I view, like, you know, the usefulness came because, you know, we, we finally have an empirically plausible uh, framework. And he contrasts nowadays with the early days. By the way, when every, anybody ever does early RBC, that means like 1982. They never talk about anything after that. Nothing happened. Um, but those early, early, early uh, RBC models, no money, uh, frictionless markets. And yeah, they missed some key properties. And, and I would say one of the key properties, one of the things that you know, a lot of us focused on was actually employment uh, and hours, which you know, is part of the dual mandate, just an FYI. Um, then were there were the early New Keynesian models, and <laughs> Bob and Neil are here. I should have added no money there, because they're always complaining, like, there's not even money in the New Keynesian models. 
Okay. Now, M Marty would say, um, well, it's really more, those were more qualitative. Like you could get some idea of signs of things, but now we have the, qu the quantitative. Okay. Challenge of Ulig. Same thing. Okay? Notice. Watch this. Check it out. Same thing. Now they're empirically plausible. How can it be the same thing? How can it be the achievement and challenge? Well, there's a but. Of course there is. The empirical fit is due to non microfounded frictions and non structural shocks. Okay. So what we're effectively doing is taking those old new no, the early, I shouldn't say old, early new Keynesian models and sticking in effectively wedges in uh, those first order conditions that aren't microfounded. That's the counter. All right, so he asks, are these models then useful? Okay, now let me focus I don't. I only have a limited time, and he's going to start flashing signs at me. So I want to focus on two of the um, shocks. It was alluded to a little bit, uh, but two exogenous shocks make up most of the variation in these models, both the early models and the current models. Okay, they're given names. These names sort of mean something, but remember they're exogenous. That's key but they account for most of the variation in real activity, not just nominal. Okay. Let me look at, again, I'm going to go back, you know, the labor market side I find the most interesting. Uh, so let me look at key, vari key labor market variables. I'll, I'll point to the work of uh, Gali smets Vouders and look at their unemployment, and then I'll look at uh, ours from uh, Gust Lopez Salida, no, Herbst goes, okay, I'll get to it when I get to it. Okay, let me start with Gali smets Fowders and their picture of unemployment. So here on the right axis is, um, that's the unemployment rate, That's this is unemployment, okay? And then you have a bunch of bars, and then you have shocks with names, they give names, okay, like productivity, risk premium, and so. Now let me do, watch this, this is really cool, color. Okay, so the wage markup and the risk premium are accounting for a lot of the graph. So these, when you sum them up, because there's negatives and po positives, you get back the black line. So then you can say, okay, how much of the variation in these series is due to these different shocks that have names? Okay, well, in the old days, it used to be lots of people talking about wage markup shocks and now lots of people are talking about risk premium shocks. And they account for, if we take it, you know, say we take tw 2009 quarter one, I mean, you know, you got 4% um, it, and 3.5 and is accounted for the red and blue. Okay, so that's a lot. Hours by Gust, Herbst, Lopez Salido, and Smith. Um, who actually are doing state-of-the-art, non-linear, do the whole thing, add the zero lower bound, do some cartwheels, and do everything. They're doing it. Okay, this is like serious stuff. Here's ours. Now, here it's a different picture, so it's just the time series. If I put only one, all, if I put all shocks on, that's the black line. If I did only TFP, only a shock to investment, or only risk premium, you get the other lines, okay? So you can see the blue line, something called risk premium, is making up a lot of the difference. So before we had risk premium and wage markups. By the way, there's no way, they didn't put in wage markups here, I'm not sure why. Money sits in this little gap here, and so does exogenous spending. Okay, but my question, of course, is are they shocks or are they wedges? Super important, because in one case, maybe they're primitive and we've got everything figured out and we can start doing policy. If it's wedges, well, as Harold said, we may be back into the conundrum of 1976. Lucas critique, okay? 
So wage markups, are they preference shocks? Or are these really monopoly rents? Matters. Risk premium, and these are just exogenous, and they're very volatile, by the way. Okay, e either way, either way, we got some explaining to do. And the risk premium, are these flight to quality shocks? Are they external financing costs? Are they capital quality shocks? I don't know. I don't know. There are always narratives in the paper, but they're exogenous shocks, and what we really need to do is figure out, you know, are they invariant to policy? Without structure, we're just summarizing the extent of our ignorance. Okay, a way forward. We could take the wedges, okay, that we have, which will help us point to promising structural DSGEs. That's step one, and it's an important step. I don't want to. I don't want to diminish it at all. But we need to identify the promising DSGEs with the microfounded frictions and primitive interpretable shocks. Then comes the super hard part where we now start going to microdata and, and really backing it up. I feel like we've only got this part. People are doing this, but there a lot's getting skipped here, I feel. Okay, now, I would be remiss uh, as a longtime employee of the Minneapolis Fed to not give you the Minneapolis Fed view on a way forward. I'll say the better way forward, which is to put more emphasis, well, less emphasis on this quarter to quarter, you know, let's get it right immediately, and more on designing rules and institutions, okay? We had a president, Gary Stern, and a research director, Art Rolnick, that put a lot of weight on the long term. Not the high frequency, but the low frequency. I know that people in certain positions can't do that. They have to talk to the press all the time. But we have hundreds and hundreds of people in central banks around the world. Surely some of them could be devoting time to designing rules and institutions. I'm giving my favorite list of some things done at the Minneapolis Fed that I think we're relevant for the quantitative easing, the current euro crisis, too big to fail. Things that are kind of like important, okay? But long term. And then these are the seeds of the, you know, like we've got the architects and then we got the engineers. They, the architects build a bedrock and, and then the engineers can come uh, work with that. Thank you. All right. I see. I guess we will. Col I, I'll collect a bunch of questions and then get the. Uh, uh, so Robert. I wanted to react to what Marty said about Calvo pricing. Um, I should say as an aside how wonderful it is to have a pricing formula named after yourself. <laughs> it made me think about other terms. Uh, Phillips curve, Taylor rule, Lucas critique, Ricardian equivalence. <laughs> 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 the barrel regression. <coughs> the barrel regression. What do you want? <laughs> I'm sure I'm leaving something out. Uh, going back to Calvo pricing, I think um, the problem with this formulation is not its simplicity. It's uh, the assumption that there's a lack of feedback from pricing errors to the hazard rate, uh, probability of adjusting uh, prices. And that specification, I think, tends to generate uh, fat tails with respect to pricing errors and sizes of price adjustments uh, when they occur. And overall, I think it ends up uh, overstating the implications of sticky prices for uh, business cycles and welfare costs related uh, to that and to inflation. Uh, so the main alternative is uh, 
what Marty uh, referred to as menu costs, and I certainly agree with him that in that formulation, you don't want to interpret menu costs literally as the cost of changing the prices that are being uh, uh, posted. Uh, but the critical element of the menu cost view, in contrast with Calvo pricing, is the idea of feedback from pricing errors to the adjustment uh, uh, probability. And that feedback is, of course, present in the menu cost uh, uh, models. And that ends up producing much smaller effects uh, uh, from sticky prices to business cycles and to associated uh, welfare costs. And I think it also ends up uh, generating a better fit to micro observations related to pricing adjustment. And that was brought out in a 2008 paper by Burstein and Helvig, and more recently in a current paper by Nakamura and uh, Steinson. Ricardo? So, uh, this is a question to Marty as well. So, Marty, um, consistent with your desire to quantify and how DSGs are extremely useful to that, you described one strategy for DSG, and I wanted you to ask you whether it's that one versus two alternatives I'm going to state. One strategy is the one that you illustrated extremely well and has been very much your work with Larry and others, which is I write a model, I see this impulse point doesn't quite work, and so, hey, I need an adjustment cost here in order to fit this. That one doesn't work, well, I need some real wage rigidity. And so it's a very inductive process of science, which is very useful insofar as it allows you to then go and fit and learn along the line where is that you need to work, culminating more recently, as you said, with adding risk premium shocks and others. Now, there's two alternatives to build DSG models that I would still call DSG modeling. One is along the lines of what Andre earlier this morning called portable models, which is I'd like to write one type of idea that really permeates across all markets. That usually pushes you towards behavioral or expectations theories. That's, for instance, the work that I was doing 15 years ago with Greg Mankey, where I said, well, if you take this idea of planning costs and management that you were saying, well, that applies to wage decisions, investment decisions, and lots of others. So let's just do that and nothing else on top of it, and let's see how far one goes and you know, one gets somewhat far. There's then a third approach, which is the one that, again, I guess this morning was in, I, exemplified by John Janakopoulos when he said, hey, I'm a theorist, here's a mechanism. Marty, now you take it and quantify in your DSG. And so a version of that would be, I've learned about four mechanisms here in this conference, maybe 10. Okay, if I add it up, maybe 35 across all the presentations. <laughs> Let's go bottom up. I have lots of micro for this, for this, for this. Let me just add them all up and build them a DSG. You, I don't, you described one uh, given time, but how do you see these three different approaches to the DSG? Because they're all about DSG and quantifying, but they're very different strategies in inductive, deductive, or ground up. Thank you. Uh, Mike? I, I wanted to respond to some of the things um, Harold said about the challenges faced by the current generation of DSG models. And of course, I, I certainly agree that there are plenty of challenges and, and you know, many, many things that um, uh, we need to try to continue to extend. But I didn't think the summary of what the obvious problems were was terribly fair to the, um, to the existing literature. One thing um, was this comment on the finding that monetary policy shocks aren't found to explain much of the variance decomposition of inflation as somehow suggesting that the models are, um, are, are way off. And I think Silvana um, already explained um, reasonably well why there's an identification problem there and that that doesn't necessarily mean that the, um, um, that the Phillips curve mechanism isn't, isn't operative. But I think maybe another important point to point out is that these models that are giving that result about the variance decomposition aren't models that imply monetary policy doesn't matter for inflation. And if anybody in the room got that impression that, that you know, these are somehow models that are saying inflation has a life unrelated to monetary policy, uh, that'd be way off. I mean, Marty was certainly right to say that the models are very much like Milton Friedman's view of the world and what they say about that. And um, the average inflation rate is completely determined by uh, the character of systematic monetary policy and the rules. The variance decomposition that you were talking about is all about um, what accounts for the short-run variations in inflation around its average level, which is not necessarily random shifts in... Um, shifts in monetary policy. And another issue that you drew attention to was the, um, um, the so-called neo-Fisherian prediction of a simple version of the model where you did an exercise in shifting the Taylor rule and saying that uh, 
a relaxation of the rule might be predicted to make nominal interest rates go up. There, I think it's important to point out, I mean, of course, that simple exercise is, is, is a well-known one in, in, um, in a lot of the expositions of New Keynesian models and also the ans various answers to it also. In the quantitative model that Marty presented, that feature was not there. I mean, Marty did the exercise of showing what the predicted response to a shift in the central bank's interest rate reaction function was, and it didn't have that property. Um, the suggestion that Silvana made, which is that maybe you need to back away from um, complete rational expectations, is one response, because the response in the simple experiment you are getting depended on people immediately foreseeing what the subsequent inflation response is going to be and having that feed into nominal interest rates quickly, but in the model that Marty presented, there were rational expectations, so that wasn't the answer. The answer was that the inflation process itself has much more inertia in it, and so the response of inflation is delayed, therefore the rationally anticipated inflation expectations don't rise nearly as rapidly, and that's, um, that's how the model was not, um, you know, not in fact getting this kind of um, neo-fisherian short-run response. Of course, the idea that a more persistent shift in the monetary policy rule would move inflation and nominal interest rates in the same direction, I think, shouldn't be puzzling. I mean, that's what we, we, should, in belie we should believe was true. The short-run effects are, in fact, not, uh, not ones that um, the standard quantitative um, DSG models actually have in them. Okay, so we're out of time, so I want to give the authors sure. the last word. Uh, sorry for those that... <laughs> I'll, I'll try and be short. So first, I want to thank Mike for those comments, but uh, I think both discussions were great. I'm actually quite stunned that Ellen and I actually agree on a major issue, and that is... <laughs> <laughs> there, you know, if you're going to do macroeconomics, you're going to have shocks, unless you want to lock yourself into an Einsteinian view of the universe and you want everything to come from nonlinear dynamics. And so then the question is always going to be, was it a shock or was it a wedge? And Ellen's right. And I alluded to this um, observational equivalence problem. We now know how to match the macro aggregates. And that's why I think the most exciting areas are exactly looking at micro data uh, to sort of gain additional information. And I think people like Arlene Wong, other people that are working on, you know, um, I, I won't belabor the point. I think we agree on that. It's hard to disagree on that. Um, on um, Silvana's comments were great. Uh, I think they were really great. Uh, it, I, I do want put to put something in perspective. There are parts of these models, and I, I've talked about this a lot with John, some things you want to take really seriously. But if you find the minor deviations from rational expectations, overturn the implications of the model, you should change the model. The classic example of that is forward guidance. We know that that's quite dicey. So uh, Gabex and, and Manuel have done work on this, uh, Nakamura and Stein. Lots of people have done work in saying show deviations from rational expectations of the representative consumer, those strong implications go away. Well, then, of course, you shouldn't take them very seriously. And I'm quite sympathetic to moving uh, in the direction of Manuel and, and, and going to behavioral, personally, uh, to the extent that they're, they're, they're feasible. On the Calvo tales, I mean, look, I think sticky plans are what's really going on. And Chris Sims once said, I love, uh, maybe Olivia wrote this, I take these models seriously in terms of their predictions for various observables. The welfare implications I personally take much less seriously for some of the reasons you're talking about. So I personally, if I was going to do welfare implications, I would want to do the sticky plans to eliminate those tails. These things only make sense in moderate inflation environments. And if I'm going to drive the welfare implications by three guys that haven't changed their prices in 10,000 years, of course I'm not going to take that. As a modeler, now I've got to say, you know, for the purposes I'm using it, do I want to go with the simplicity and elegance of the, of the, the Calvo model? Uh, for the purposes at hand, or do I want to put in the sticky plans, which is considerably harder? Um, you know, uh, to Ricardo, I, there's not enough time to really respond to that. It's a great question. Um, I'm pursuing one approach. I think people should pursue whatever approach they want. Uh, but I do think the future is looking at micro data to get a finer feeling uh, for what's going on, uh, but the mechanisms, are they plausible or not? We've sort of hit the end of what we can learn from just the aggregate time series. Harold, I want to... 
give you the last word. Yeah, so, th so thanks for the comments. You know, these were great discussions. Uh, discussions. So let me go uh, after the Phillips curve once more. So it may well be that the Phillips curve has gone away because monetary policy is now really optimal and therefore we don't see that trade-off in the, in the data anymore. It's certainly true when I put up that Keynesian regression, the XT is an endogenous regress on the right-hand side, so I certainly can see the point that you have to be careful. Nonetheless, it's that it's not that visible in the data anymore might give uh, one cause uh, for pause. I, you know, to identify whether there's really a Phillips curve trade-off requires identification of monetary policy shocks. I've, been, I've written a paper in the JME in 2005 that some people may remember, so I don't want to rehash that debate. Instead, let me just focus on one episode in particular that we all remember, which is the Paul Volcker episode. The Paul Volcker, we often talk about the Paul Volcker disinflation. You know, inflation rose a lot, and then Paul Volcker came in, and he, said, he suddenly said, we turn monetary policy around, and then you know, there was a deep recession, and inflation came down. And sometimes people refer to that as a Volcker recession, as a, and, and it's a Paul Volcker uh, disinflation episode. But if you take this metz Wouters model, which has become a key workhorse model many of these central banks, that's the whole purpose of this exercise that I just did. This metz Wouters model just says inflation came down by itself. It just, it just was a bunch of negative uh, shocks to, to price wage markup shocks. Monetary policy, you know, that, that model you know, had monetary policy constant throughout that episode. I mean, maybe, right? It's, uh, it's possible that, that, that Paul Volcker didn't do anything to monetary policy and then inflation came down all in itself and the recession all by itself, right? It's possible, right? But I, so I, I, I'm sympathetic to the perspective that monetary policy has a lot to do with inflation. I'm also sympathetic with the view that, the Paul, that entering Paul Volcker in 1980 was, or end of 1979, I should say, and this change in monetary policy w was a shock. But, but that particular model that we picked, and that's a prominent model, doesn't give you that, and that's something that we need to take seriously. Okay, we're out of time.